everybody, and welcome to The Brand Called You. This is a podcast and a video chat where we talk to some of the world's most interesting thought leaders. Today, though, I'm super excited. Have you ever heard of a female butcher before? I certainly had until I met Eleanor Friedman, who is a female butcher. Now, as you can imagine, and from what I'm learning, this is almost as rare as finding a female firefighter or you know, a, a female, I don't know what, I mean, if, if there's only only a, a less than maybe a quarter of all butchers are female. So I'm super excited to hear about how she got into it, how this happened and what she does. So I'd like to welcome you, Eleanor. Hi, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess the way to start is first by telling us um, how the hell you became a female butcher. It's a pretty male dominated industry still, isn't it? It is current. I mean, I know a handful, I mean, but I think that's also probably because I am one. And so consequently you pick up on other people who are doing similar things. Um, but certainly a male dominated industry, especially in like the larger um, companies. And for me, how this all came to pass was the long road back from vegetarianism. Um, and that was really my in because I decided I was working at a restaurant that had their own farm and felt that their practices were okay, that the reasons that I wasn't eating meat was, were more because I didn't stand behind how animals were necessarily being raised, treated, and so on and so forth. And I felt like if I was to respect the job that I was in and the chef that I was working for, that it would behoove me to try um, some of the dishes, but I didn't want to do that without having ownership over the process. Wow. And so I, um, I, the part where I ended up in Italy learning how to do this was sort of like roundabout and a little bit bizarre, but um, I ended up working on a farm. I wanted to be able to raise the animals. I wanted to be able to process the animals. Um, and so through a chain of events of different um, connections, I ended up in Italy working um, with livestock and then returned to be making salumi, which is the Italian word for charcuterie that includes everything from sausage to prosciutto. Um, and well, hold on, I got to stop you because you yeah. said so many things in one yeah. sentence that I'm, my mind is spinning. So the first thing you mentioned was, and something that has come up a lot lately, although I, you for sure were ahead of your time, which is the effect of, of raising meat uh, on our environment. Um, and they say that it's responsible for a, a huge amount of greenhouse gas. And I guess, could you first comment on, 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 on you know, that aspect of it? And, and were you aware of it and, you know, how that's changing? I think at the time I was more concerned, not, it was less of a, hot topic greenhouse gas and global warming however many years ago this was but there definitely was an environmental impact and runoff and like those kinds of things at the time um and for me it was like more of an animal welfare component and then as i delved further in all of these other things sort of came to the surface um what and do you mean by what do you mean by animal welfare can you just break that down for us so like none of the animals that we work with, for example, are raised in feedlots or have like just outdoor access. I mean, these are animals that are in the field, living their best life. The pastures oh. are being rotated. They're in between woodland and pasture. They're getting to run around. They're getting to be themselves. They have access it's the reverse. They have access to appropriate shelter if, you know, it's cold and they need to be in a little piggy hug pile, but they're majority outside as they would be, you know, like think about a wild boar, for example, like it's the same kind of idea. Of course, there's a lot more attention given to them because they're farm animals, but the concept is sort of similar. Well, so let me ask you, does the taste of meat, the quality of meat, is it different if they've been raised in, not in a feedlot? 
A hundred percent. I mean, there is a number of variables. I mean, of course there's a genetic variable, but I have, I personally think, and I'm not any sort of like authority aside from that. I've been seeing this over, you know, the last decade, but I wouldn't say I'm a scientist or anything like this, but so the genetic component, yes, it's there. But the main thing that I see that creates the biggest difference is diet, which includes forage as well as exercise. And so if, if the animals are in a feedlot, they're not really moving around so much. They're going to be floppy. There's going to be a lot of more water content. Um, and it's just yeah. going to be a different, a different end result. So I do believe that raising animals in a way that's better for them, which is also better for the environment, you know, it's like not as much impact. Um, directly goes hand in hand with I wonder a, better, also, a better eating product. I wonder if also there's less stress hormone going through their system. I'm, sh I'm sure. Although I don't know how many studies have been done of stress in life versus stress at the moment of death, which is touchy. Now, now that brings up another interesting point, which is the slaughter aspect. Um, I know like as a Jewish person, there's a specific kind of kosher slaughter, which is, is relatively, um, it, it, I, I guess it's with a knife cut and so forth. Just the way um, an animal kills, is that also affects the way it tastes? I'm sorry to be so. No, it, uh, it does. You can see it. I can, I mean, and this is like, maybe not for the, it depends on who wants to be. Maybe there's a warning before we listen to this episode. Um, when you're butchering, an animal, it's basically like doing an autopsy, right? You can see the quality of life in a lot of ways and you can see wow. what happened at death. So if the certain things, if the animal is stressed, there are certain spots that can go through it. If it's really stressed, the meat becomes inedible. Why do you think? It like turns into this like mush. It's this stress hormone that runs through the body. It's called PSE and, um, it renders the, the, and, and that, that's like, I've only seen that maybe one time ever, but you could literally just poke your finger through. Wow. What, like is the most, what is the most humane way to slaughter an animal? I mean, I think it depends on the animal, right? Um, I think the throat cut is pretty, you know, for something small, like a sheep or, you know, a lamb. Um, typically, um, pigs are bolted and then, um, they get like a quick bolt to the head and then they're drained. Um, I don't do the slaughter. I mean, I have been at slaughterhouses, but we, you know, we are not a slaughterhouse. We know yeah. another one that but, we but, know very but, well. But Eleanor, what fascinates me is in pre preparing for my interview with you, I started looking at pictures. I mean, this is not for the faint hearted butchering. And I'm trying to understand, like, I could barely look at the pictures of the meat. How, how did you transcend the icky, scary part of it? I think I truly for myself believe that if I'm going to eat this, that even if it's hard and it should be hard, like, I don't think that killing an animal should be easy. And I don't even think sometimes I'm standing at the table and I'm looking at a, you know, essentially a carcass and I'm, you know, and I say, I'm sorry, like, I feel thankful and I feel badly. And I think that that is legitimate. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, I'm not going to prescribe this for everybody. You know, everybody's entitled to their own value system, thought process, et cetera. But for me, it's really important that if I'm going to eat anything, like I need to, I need to know, and I need to be able to kind of mu muscle through, I guess, me both in this case, physically and mentally muscle through it. And so I'd say for me, that that's the answer to, to that question. Sure. And let me ask you something. What do you think um, this new crop of female butchers are bringing to the table, so to speak, that how are they contributing like an additional element that men perhaps didn't bring before? You know, I don't know that I can even answer that question necessarily because I haven't really worked with that many of them. I mean, I've, I've heard- Like I've just heard watching from a distance- I, I don't, I don't know. I did go to this one conference that was very specific. It was titled something along the lines of 
women in meat in the Northeast. So that is like super, super, super niche. Um, and the idea there was that um, there were all of these, you know, the same way that there would have been any sort of like meat conference, but that there, the, because of the absence of men, that maybe people who would have felt embarrassed to ask a question, it was a, a more open forum. Um, I think there's probably a little less like needing to be tough about it or something, but I, I don't also, you know, gender is really shifting these days. Yeah. In terms of yes. perceptions. So there's so much to unpack there that I just, I, I mean, I, I, I've heard I think what's hard is that like things are physically built more for men in the same way that things are physically built more for right-handed people like scissors or something, yeah. you know, it's that, that is when I've worked in other places, like our facilities built to my specs, but when I've worked in other places, I'm like, I can't reach that. <laughs> okay. I, I've read that, that these days it's, it's, you, you know, you don't have to handle a full carcass the way they used to back in the day when men, you know, that, that, that you don't have to lift full quarters these days, that it's smaller pieces. And that makes it a little That's easier. That's not true for us. Okay. We get in, um, we only work with pigs, so it's smaller than a beef. Um, we get them in split down the center. So each side is like anywhere from like a really small one would be a hundred pounds. Um, and then like a larger one, like sometimes it'll even be like up to 180 a side. So has it, has it built muscle in you, in you? Oh my gosh. Yeah. My biceps are huge. <laughs> they don't need to work out. This is it's a very, I like, uh, it's, it's like borderline embarrassing. <laughs> it's a unique way to do a workout, isn't it? It's like very, it's, but it's like very specific, like Popeye muscles. It's not like how you would have chosen to sculpt your body. It's like, wow. And at, at, you have labor you have your arms. You're the only one I know who I can say has butcher arms. My uncle says I have a bionic arm. <laughs> so tell me, how do you source your meat? We currently work with three farms um, that are located in the Hudson Valley. And all of these three farms I've known for upwards of, well, I guess Skylar. I don't know. I would say one of them I've worked with, like either like through other, when I've worked at other places and sourced or, you know, they were already being brought in in the city. Um, but at least like 10 years for most of them. And we do spend time going to, we were also friends with all these people at this point. Um, you know, we go to the farm, we see, and you can't just go like once before you purchase. Like you have oh. to go continuously, in my opinion, because oh. things change over time, right? So like, what if someone is just using the same pasture over and over again? It looks good that one day. But if they're not, if they're doing that, then it's being like churned up. That goes to your like gases situation. You, you know, there really needs to be management so that, and, and pigs are hard on the land. One of the farmers we use is really help uses it to like, they had some really messed up land when they moved in, they used it to like clear it to do something productive. Um, and they have this agreement with one of their, like a vegetable farm neighbor where basically they rotate their pigs in on the pasture to fertilize it for him. So he doesn't use commercial fertilizers. And as like, a, there's like a trade component, like he gets a pig a year or something. So he, they use them, he saves on fertilizer. It's organic. Wow. Well, I, I, guess. I should mention for people that are watching from all over the world that the Hudson Valley is in New York state. And you currently um, have also have a small, um, a shop where you you sell your own charcuterie in the Catskill Mountains and maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and how that happened and what you do there. So in our shop so our facility is in the back of the shop and our production is both for wholesale so like restaurants and other specialty food stores that we you know ship across the across the country um, and uh, then the shop was our way we didn't we want, didn't want to just plunk down somewhere and not have any way to interact with the community. So it was our way to have some sort of dialogue with the community. It just so happened that we opened our business 
um, in the heart of the COVID pandemic. And so we actually couldn't get our approvals for our USDA facility. They weren't inspecting new facilities at the time. Um, and so really kind of went forward with our store, which my husband honestly ha does most of the, um, he sort of heads off. So we have a lot of Italian specialties. He is from Southern Italy. We met while I was working in Italy, um, in Tuscany. He was also, which is not in Southern Italy, but we were both there at the time. Um, and then we have, and now we finally have our full line of, of products as well that we make here in house. And the idea is that everything kind of builds out from our product line. So what you might wanna eat with or before or after to be able to structure a whole meal and also as a place to just talk and hang out and learn about food history. Well, I have to tell you, you don't know this about me, but I, I used to, I, I had a long-term partner who was what's called a, a mashkiach, which is um, the rabbi that um, looks at, you know, what is, is kosher in a place and his specialty was meat. So I, I, I know what it's like to be in partnership with a meat guy who, instead of looking at windows for fashionable clothing or, you know, unique um, iPhones, he would get obsessed with the marbling in a butcher shop window. So I, I, I'm fascinated that you also have a partner and what you have in common, among other things, is the meat. So tell yeah. me about, tell me about th this in Italy, you know, how you met and what you did there and what you what you bring to the table that's in influenced and inspired by Italy. So in Italy, he was working as a chef in a restaurant in Siena, and I was working on a farm in rural Tuscany, um, doing essentially the same things that I'm doing here, processing, making salumi. Um, and we met basically through mutual friends. Siena is a city that is a small town. Um, and so we were just out and about one night, and he was with a friend that you know, I knew and, and the rest, he invited me to dinner and the rest is history. Um, as far as that part is concerned, um, as far as bringing from Italy, as far as inspiration from Italy and how that affects our business, I would say, you know, we try very hard to differentiate ourselves from a lot of American salumi charcuterie companies that are just pulling from all over the place. Um, we focus almost exclusively on Tuscan regional salumi. So not just, not wider Italy. Um, and we, then we will have a few other products that are beyond that scope. And with the, and the reason being is to be able to utilize the whole animal and respect the whole animal in a way that the population here will enjoy those products. There are certain tastes that are different. And as much as I would love to stick to my guns and do 100% Tuscan salumi and not waste anything and stick to that, the, the truth is, is we're not necessarily going to use all of the product that way. And it's more important to respect the animal. So in when we, you know, we're doing product testing and market assessment, there were a few choices we made to be able to utilize um, more of the animal, but beyond that, it's very focused. Can you, can you tell people who are watching what Tuscan salumi is? So each region, and I mean, it's different because it's been going on for, you know, forever. And in terms of production, it would be different from hilltop to hilltop, you know, at the time, but each region has more of its influence. So in Tuscany, there isn't very much spice like pepper, sorry, black pepper. Yes. Chili pepper. No, um, a lot of the salumi that's come to the States has been from Southern Italy because that's where a lot of the immigrants were from. So what people are familiar with, like soprasata in Tuscany, soprasata doesn't even mean the same thing. It's a type of head cheese. Um, it's not a salami. So there's a lot of fennel and black pepper and just very simple, clean flavors that are used in, in the Tuscan preparation. That I would say is like the, the most defining factor of it yeah but but do you bring I, I know you were raised Jewish in America do you bring any any a little twist from your own heritage that you throw in sort of accidentally or intentionally I think so not in that and not in that realm like maybe if I'm cooking something there might be some sort of 
channeling of someone, but it's more of like a general cooking technique. I try and stick pretty, pretty close to what I learned from the guys that I worked with in Italy. All right. So I've been in your shop and I'm obsessed with your salumi or salami, as I would call it. Let mm -hmm. me ask you from the time you, you, you source the meat and it's in the back of your shop, how mm -hmm. long does it take to create what, what I will walk away with? So like the smaller format salami that you typically get, I would say, you know, anywhere from, so it comes into the store, like me, like six to eight weeks, typically something like this. But then for a larger product, like a prosciutto, you're talking two years and then anything in the middle, it has to do with size and diameter and weight. So the larger the pieces, the longer it takes. That's fascinating. And what are some of your goals you know, new things that you want to try or explore or bring to your shop? Oh, that's a hard one. That's actually on our like to-do list of things to talk about in the post-holiday season. Well, I we're mean, there. I think, you know, we would love to be able to have more prepared foods and things, but we are very limited by the space that we have here. Um, and so what we're trying to not get too tangled up in is growing too fast and expanding over too many things and trying to do what we're doing well and to grow that and then to take the next step once the first one is stabilized. But I think I was wondering if, are there any new modern approaches or techniques to what you do that you are integrating with the more traditional ones? I mean, we do use controlled environments. So we do use fermentation chambers that are controlled. We do use aging rooms that we set the temperature. The thing that's really funny about it is, but that's more about like having something be regulated rather than efficacy, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, because basically, you know, we take our basement that that we will be expanding into at some point to have additional rooms it was perfect temperature perfect everything but then you're forced to insulate the whole thing and then shove energy into it to make it regulated so it's a little bit silly but you need to do there's just a lot of paperwork involved with meat production and distribution and you have to yeah. be compliant and you know, there is a reason for that. Like you, you're feeding the public. You're not just feeding your own family and taking risks for yourself, which, you know, is a much heavier burden to bear. Is it a rewarding career? I'd say so. I mean, we're still so young in, and, and things have grown in such a different way because of the pandemic. Like for everybody, we're not unique in this. Um, so it's hard to see how things are going, but I do very much stand behind, you know, making, producing meat products for people who choose to eat meat that I can stand behind because I don't think that people are going to stop. And so if they're not going to stop, let's offer something better. What I'm wanting to work on in the next steps is better packaging where I've explored all of these backyard compostable things and they just weren't functioning. So it's cool to have something that's a better option, but if the better option doesn't work, it's not actually a better option. So, you know, as we're again, getting like more stable with where we are in our production with our clients and all of these things to then take next steps to to expand that way. Initially, the, the vision was to be like a model business for sustainability. And with the pandemic, everything kind of went out the window a little bit, which is not to say like, we are doing so much better than, I don't know what percentage, like most of the businesses out there, but we really wanna push further. Well, I had no idea how thoughtful you were about what you were doing. Um, and it's so fascinating to me. I mean, my only, Butcher memory is Mr. Diamond in Passaic, New Jersey, the kosher butcher who 25 years later it was revealed was selling unkosher meat. So <laughs> That's you, have, you have been the the you have been the healing, the healing force behind my kosher, my, my butcher memories. That's very funny though. You have to admit very funny. Yes, but I mean, 
no, really, it's it's very interesting how thoughtful you are about it. And I think I'm gonna now taste your your products with a whole new new feeling about them. So I, I really want to thank you. I mean, I, I think so many of us have been illuminated by <laughs> this, which none of us know much about. And especially as a woman, I think it's fabulous. And um, I want to wish you continued success in what you do. And um, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing some of your knowledge with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me. <laughs> I'll look forward to my next visit. Sounds good. I'll see you soon. <laughs> okay. Bye, Eleanor. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.